Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar, Real World Utility of Fecal Calprotectin Testing, presented by Dr. KT Park, Associate Professor and Co-Director, Stanford Children's Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center, Stanford University School of Medicine. I'm Alexis Corrales of Labyrinth, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational webinar presented by Labyrinth and sponsored by Innova Diagnostics. For more than 25 years, the Innova Diagnostics team has collaborated with clinical researchers to develop biomarkers to help advance the care of autoimmune disease patients. They are redefining autoimmunity, leveraging their innovative spirit to deliver solutions that anticipate the needs of laboratories and improve the efficiency and quality of testing. For more information, please visit www.innovadx.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Simply type them into the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Now, let's get started. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the Answer a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab and follow the process to obtain your credits. Additionally, your slide window will also automatically redirect you at the end of the presentation where you can access your credits. I would like to now introduce today's presenter, Dr. KT Park. Dr. Park is an associate professor in the Division of Gastroenterology, Department of Pediatrics, and a Stanford Health Policy Faculty Associate. He serves as, as the co-director of Stanford's Children's IBD Center and the medical director of the Short Stay Infusion Unit at Stanford Children's Health. Dr. Park's current NIH-funded research is to discover cost-effective ways to manage Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Recently, he is dedicated in his clinical practice and research endeavors to monitor intestinal inflammation in patients with IBS and IBD. Dr. Park, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, and um, I look forward to the conversation after the presentation as well. Uh, the title of my talk is Real World Utility of Fecal Calprotectin Testing. And I really want to emphasize the description here that this is a real-world uh, presentation from my patients, from patients that I treat, uh, memorable cases that I think can help us understand how the, how the calprotectin test can be useful. So here's my lecture outline, and um, I'll first talk about what is calprotectin currently in this age of biomarkers. Everybody's trying to find a biomarker to monitor chronic conditions. Um, and uh, case one, two, and three uh, really uh, come from my experience with this test over the last um, six to seven years. Um, first is a diagnostic case. Uh, where I really started to understand the potential for the utility of calprotectin. The second uh, case was um, uh, this patient who had asymptomatic um, disease. Uh, he really did not have any complaints, um, and uh, this was a way of monitoring his uh, condition um, without relying on him reporting his uh, disease activity. And the third uh, is uh, sort of a, a brief snapshot of how we can use calprotectin in, in a personalized way in this age of personalized uh, health and monitoring, uh, self-monitoring of disease. And finally, I'll just give a little uh, discussion about potential future utility. So without further ado, what is calprotectin? It's a calcium-bound protein extruded from um, dying inflammatory cells, particularly neutrophils and monocytes, they are structural proteins. So they're basically the pillars that hold up the cell wall. And um, when you think about um, how 
this particular protein comes out of the cell and into the, into the extracellular matrix uh, when they have died, uh, it can be a good marker of cellular death and turnover. Uh, there's some pragmatic co uh, collection information that we will discuss later on in the presentation that's, I think, important for uh, education for the patient as they are collecting their stool. Um, so this is a book chapter that I recently uh, helped author with a, uh, um, with a senior fellow. And um, right away, when we started to um, do the research for stool biomarkers, we realized that calprotectin was just one of many. And here is just a list um, of some of the more prominent um, uh, biomarkers in the stool that uh, have been uh, researched. But right now, uh, calprotectin is really the leading commercially available uh, biomarker, stool biomarker test for inflammation. I think we've had uh, lactoferrin come on the scene um, around the same time, but really calprotectin in terms of uh, the, the, the patients that I see um, with chronic inflammation in the GI tract, calprotectin has emerged as the uh, commercially available um, uh, test of choice. And, um, but I do want to comment that um, we are looking and still trying to discover um, what is the best biomarker. It's sort of like uh, hunting for the lost ark, and I find that uh, uh, we're constantly uh, pressing the envelope to see whether perhaps um, a, um, a constellation or a collective assay uh, of these biomarkers could be better than just looking at one biomarker like the calprotectin. So, for example, um, we have um, positive predictive value and negative predictive value. And interestingly, in the third line there, the neutrophil elastase, that particular um, uh, biomarker could be a better predictor for remission uh, if you don't have any of, the, any of that uh, or have very little of, uh, of that neutrophil elastase present in your, in your stool. So there is a possibility for uh, other biomarkers to come on the scene, not just calprotectin, uh, but right now I will focus on calprotectin because that's what I use and that's what I have most real-world experience in. So the backdrop of what I do is uh, treatment of patients with chronic um, inflammatory bowel disease. And these conditions include um, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and this is a slide um, from a recent paper that shows the, um, the epic uh, increase in incidence of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, and if you know anything about um, inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, they can be quite debilitating. Uh, they can really impact the quality of life. Uh, essentially disable a person from leading a normal uh, lifestyle. So previously in the U.S., we thought maybe there's 1.5 million or so patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, but we're really starting to realize that uh, not only is the incidence rapidly increasing over the last uh, decade or so, but we're seeing that maybe the actual total prevalence is much higher than the 1.5 million. Um, and this graph shows that even if um, we're, we're getting better at trying to diagnose the disease, uh, there's some signal there for sure uh, that the actual incidence uh, is increasing in developing and developed countries. So I want to move on to the first case. Let's not um, uh, get too far into the introduction. I want to really talk and spend time on the real patients uh, that I help to take care of. And obviously, these are just stock photos, and they're not my real patients. And the names are, uh, uh, the first names are made up, but they are real patients. And this particular patient I saw way back uh, I believe it was like 2009 or 2010, 
But anyway, she was a 16-year-old uh, adolescent female who was quite accomplished. She uh, um, was a cheerleader and was academically high achieving, and she had a couple of months of abdominal pain and occasional diarrhea. Uh, and we really thought this was all related to stress. Um, and she had no chronic medical conditions or problems except for perhaps seasonal allergies. She really had no sick contacts or travel. She really had no risk factors, and she had a healthy diet, healthy lifestyle. <clears throat> and the pediatrician worked her up with the appropriate complete uh, blood count, um, the complete metabolic uh, panel, the celiac panel, stool cultures. Um, all of these were negative. But interestingly, the pediatrician... Um, check the stool guaiac, which is a blood, uh, a, a test to see if there's blood in the stool, and sure enough, it was positive. And that's when they called me just over the phone. I hadn't seen her at the time, and I said, interesting, let's get a, um, a Clostridium difficile toxin test, and lo and behold, it was positive. And um, we really thought this was a community-acquired uh, Clostridium difficile infection that perhaps she got just in the community, and we treated appropriately, and she finished the course of uh, oral flagyl or metronidazole and reported improvement. Um, but then three months later, she comes back to the pediatrician and reports um, you know, early satiety, occasional diarrhea, fatigue, uh, but the seed of testing on repeat was actually negative, and all the other blood uh, panels were normal. But interestingly, her albumin was ever so slightly low, and you can get a low albumin, which is protein in the blood, just because you're not eating well or you're malnourished. So people thought perhaps um, the diet was related to that low albumin, so my colleague ended up um, doing an endoscopy colonoscopy, uh, and this was um, completely normal. Um, everything looked good, except for just a little bit of stomach irritation, which I think um, is very nonspecific. So what happened there? Um, we provided, um, uh, they were provided reassurance, um, you know, after a negative endoscopy colonoscopy, and they said, that uh, she had irritable bowel syndrome, and notice that there's a difference here. Irritable bowel syndrome is different from inflammatory bowel disease. Irritable bowel syndrome is basically uh, what a lot of patients, uh, what a lot of people without chronic conditions have, which is just they get upset stomach, they get occasional disordered stooling, and um, um, they need to check their dairy or their food uh, dietary uh, history, and sometimes there can be a trigger and sometimes not. Uh, so irritable bowel syndrome is really not a chronic condition that's disabling um, for the most part. So um, the patient then uh, feels frustrated and um, decides to come to me as a new patient for a second opinion, and I... I uh, thought to myself, this is um, a stressed out teenager who's high achieving, and I'm sure there is likely uh, no patho pathology here. Uh, but reluctantly, I ordered an MR enterogram, which is an MRI, uh, to run the small bowel, and it was normal. And um, everything so far supported the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. And because she just kept on complaining, um, I reluctantly repeated another endoscopy colonoscopy, and I send out a stool calprotectin uh, before that scope. And lo and behold, this was one of the first calprotectins I had ever sent. And lo and behold, it was 98 microgram per gram. And I look up on the Internet and uh, my papers in my archived folders and notice that, hmm, interesting, 98 it seems to be slightly high and not perfect, so what do I do with that? So looking at the literature, uh, there seemed to be this signal that if you had a calprotectin greater than 50 microgram per gram, you really have a good... 
possibility of finding something on endoscopy and colonoscopy. So here's the paper that I sort of went to, and it was the paper by Trimble. Uh, this was one of the um, landmark papers in GUT, uh, which is a, a high-impact journal. And you can tell that patients with Crohn's disease um, had a clear increase in, in quantitative calprotectin levels compared to patients who had irritable bowel syndrome only. Uh, and patients who had other things, other conditions such as infections, parasites, and cancer could be sort of all over the place as well. Uh, but really, I was wondering whether this patient had irritable bowel syndrome, but this patient had calprotectin close to 100, which really didn't fit with patients with irritable bowel syndrome. So, I repeat the endoscopy colonoscopy, and lo and behold, I get into deep into the small intestine where I think my colleague previous did not get to, um, uh, and there were ulcers on, on the scope. Uh, this was the classic difficult to diagnose duodenal Crohn's disease, and this is how the um, you know, my interest and, 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 and um, evolution of calprotectin began. Um, so she is currently actually still on um, this drug called infliximab or Remicade, and she's doing really well. She's uh, in college now, and I think she might have even finished college, but anyway, she's doing really well. So that particular patient inspired me to um, be... Um, um, be an academic <laughs> uh, for a question that, uh, that I really just wanted to answer. Was it cost effective for me to send off a fecal calprotectin uh, test before I started to go down the pathway of um, endoscopy and colonoscopy? So the first um, left panel uh, decision tree was we looked at uh, pediatric and adult patients um, who uh, had a fecal calprotectin test before their endoscopy, which was currently then not the standard of care, and tried to compare that with just standard of care, which is no calprotectin testing, and going straight to endoscopy for a patient um, who comes, comes in with vague complaints, such as just, I'm having abdominal pain, uh, dear doctor, please figure out what's going on. The second panel on the right is trying to get at the question of um, what is the optimal cutoff? Do I consider greater than 50 a indicator to go to scope, or should I consider greater than 100? Because as you remember, um, um, you know, in the patient Stacy, uh, she had a 98, so that was sort of right there in the in between in between those, but closer to the um, the higher cutoff. Uh, and this was what was in the literature, okay? So what did we find? I won't bore you with the details of the methods, but basically we found that it was actually very cost-effective to go ahead and send off a calprotectin uh, before your endoscopy, colonoscopy as a gastroenterologist if you were not um, confident that this patient had uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So essentially... Uh, in, a, in adults, you would be saving $400 or, $400 or so per patient, but maybe you would have a little bit of a delayed diagnosis uh, among the 100 patients that you encountered in clinic. And then in children, you would save a little bit less uh, per patient, and then maybe you would have a little bit more uh, patients who might have a delayed diagnosis among the 100 patients that you saw in clinic. Now, this is interesting because in real life, uh, you don't want to lose those patients to follow up because potentially they could have other complications while not seeing their doctor, right? So the reason why you save a little bit less in the pediatric population is because the, pre, um, the, um, the actual specificity is a little bit less in, the, in children uh, than in adults. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the statistical meaning of 
of uh, sensitivity and specificity and why that impacts uh, cost-effectiveness analyses like what I've done, we've done here. But clearly, uh, the point, take-home point is that uh, in patients who um, come in with vague abdominal pain and you're suspicious of irritable bowel syndrome as opposed to inflammatory bowel disease, uh, it is cost-effective to go ahead and test their uh, stool for calprotectin. Uh, and then in the second aim, we did note uh, there in the, in the fourth bullet point there that calprotectin uh, uh, cutoff at uh, 50 is actually more cost effective uh, than at the 100, okay? So moving along, uh, this changed the way I practiced, essentially. Um, I'm, I, I started to sort of um, uh, tell all of my gastroenterologist colleagues about this uh, because no, I, was the, I was really the first one in my group anyway to start sending calprotectin and it really caught on and it really helped to, I think, uh, be more precise uh, in the way we uh, send patients to an endoscopy and colonoscopy, which in pediatrics, obviously, that's an invasive procedure regardless of um, of whether you have uh, general anesthesia or not. And, and um, the adults um, would, would say that it's invasive for them as well. So uh, the point here is that um, I think this really changed the way we looked at calprotectin moving forward. And um, we are always trying to wonder, we're trying, as clinicians, we're trying to decipher every moment how much value is the patient reported symptoms? So, so a lot of patients with irritable bowel syndrome uh, will come in and say, I have abdominal pain, I have abdominal pain, I have abdominal pain. And if you were to scope them every single time they have abdominal pain, that's actually malpractice and that would not be uh, good for the patient. Um, so that's over-reliance on the patient-reported symptoms, which can lead to over-medicalization and even harm uh, and increased healthcare services. Um, when you have under-reliance in, 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 in the next case that I'm going to talk to you about, uh, essentially, uh, the patient might be stoic or they might not be engaged in their health care, and they don't really report anything to you as, the, as their doctor. And this can lead to, the, lead to delayed diagnoses uh, or delayed prevention, delayed uh, comprehensive therapy plans. So, so it, I think it's really important to understand the precision that is possible with calprotectin. Um, and not just as a one-time uh, decision tree um, uh, maker, of whether you go to scope or not, but we'll talk about monitoring uh, for the next uh, several slides here. So I think it's safe to say that patients are highly variable. Variability is the law of life, as, uh, as William o Osler said. And um, not every, uh, each patient is different. And I think uh, it's safe to say that we have to consider uh, an objective marker uh, such as calprotectin, uh, which is quantifiable and with the strength of evidence behind it to help uh, clinicians in their decision making and recommendations for patients. So I'll, I want to move on to the case two because I think this is where I now uh, turn the chapter again on calprotectin in the real world. And um, this is a real, uh, I, I really, <laughs> enjoyed getting to know this patient. He is quite a funny guy. Uh, he came to me um, as, a, as an adult. Um, he was 20 and, oh, um, I'm sorry, he, was, he, was, um, uh, he came back to me as an adult. I initially diagnosed him with ulcerative colitis um, age, at age 14. He was sort of uh, seen by other providers um, and colleagues, um, but um, Anyway, he initially presented with um, just what we call fulminant pancolitis, meaning it presented with really bad um, uh, rectal bleeding, and his entire colon was affected. Uh, he was hospitalized uh, initially, um, uh, and he required systemic corticosteroids and biologic therapies, 
Uh, he even had to go on bowel rest and had total parenteral nutrition. And interestingly, this is the type of patient that would have had their colon removed in order to try to uh, temporize the disease, but we uh, uh, we trialed a um, medical therapy called tacrolimus, which is used in our transplant patients, uh, solid organ transplant patients, and it actually worked, and he actually got to keep his colon. Um, and um, he always remembers that, you know, that encounter of starting the tacrolimus because it was a scary drug at the time. Um, but interestingly, this is actually the most important uh, point about, uh, about Dylan. He's always stoic. He never complained of pain. He did not uh, feel pain. Uh, I'm not sure if he had pain and just didn't tell us or if his uh, pain threshold uh, was, you know, in, a, in the stratosphere. But anyway, he really was a stoic guy, and he, may, he might have had some cramping, but even with such a, a dramatic presentation, he was not complaining of ongoing pain, pain, and pain. Um, so after he got under control, um, he achieved really years of endoscopic remission. Deep remission is what we call it. He successfully graduated high school. And then, lo and behold, he wanted to uh, move on to new and better things. He had good control over his ulcerative colitis and wanted to go to Puerto Rico with his classmates uh, after graduation. And he said he was in perfect health uh, without any symptoms of colitis. And halfway through that week in Puerto Rico, he started having rectal bleeding five to ten times a day. Now, mind you, he did not have a prodrome. He was never in pain uh, or had um, these warning lights come on that would tell him to tell me that he needs to um, be seen um, uh, in clinic uh, before he went on to Puerto Rico. So returning home, he was dehydrated. We barely got him in, uh, I think, in time. And he had lots of blood loss and was ultimately hospitalized again for two to three weeks. So um, the story is quite dramatic, but I think it, it shows you the variability between patients. Um, and ultimately, we changed his medications around, and we are monitoring his calprotectin. Serial measurements, repeated measurements, regardless of symptoms. So he can have no pain, no diarrhea, and we're still going to check his calprotectin. We are proactively monitoring him using a non-invasive biomarker to track his disease. Um, and uh, he agrees that it's better than getting a colonoscopy. So there you go. Um, so the, um, you know, I think I want to zoom out just for this particular slide and kind of show you all uh, how calprotectin fits into the paradigm of how we monitor patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So clearly at the top of the tip of the iceberg there, you have uh, symptoms. Um, and then just underneath that, you have biomarkers or blood in the stool. Uh, you can argue, though I could argue back, that maybe imaging is not as good as biomarkers. And then you have endoscopy, um, just looking uh, grossly at how the colon looks when you go inside. And, um, and then at the very bottom, you have the histology, which is the gold standard. We're always aiming for endoscopic or histologic healing, okay? Because, like I said, you can have lots of pain and not a whole lot of endoscopic or histologic disease. Or you could have... Um, no pain and have lo ha have substantial amount of endoscopic and histologic healing. So I think this is where um, the leveraging of uh, uh, calprotectin monitoring can come in handy, uh, which is what my patients do. And this is a paper that we just published in Inflammatory Bowel Disease, uh, which kind of shows you um, in a schematic where um, how to think about this. So clearly, uh, when the patient is not doing well, um, it's in the red 
and you achieve control through therapy plan modulation, immune suppressants, and trying to work with different uh, pharmacotherapy agents that you have. And the patient is clearly back in the calprotectin target range. They're continuing to be monitored a long time. And then, interestingly, they will uh, have an inflection point upwards into the yellow, um, and you know at that particular point, that is the check engine light. That is where the car is running well, but there's something going on that tells you you need to look a little deeper and bring it back into um, good um, target range. So um, um, we used to have lots of debates about whether this was a good use of resources, uh, but interestingly, there are papers now coming out that, uh, that shows that this sort of proactive monitoring and treating to target using less invasive biomarkers is um, uh, certainly a, um, a, um, a strategy that improves health outcomes for our patients. And this is the paper, the cover that, um, that showcase, showcases that schematic. Uh, this, was our, this was actually the first systematic review uh, in uh, patients with uh, no symptoms. Uh, so um, we are uh, certainly um, um, pushing the envelope to how often and how, um, how much you should be uh, relying on calprotectin for your treatment strategies. And I will be the first one to say that the systematic review that we published um, has a weakness, and the weakness is that um, although we found a whole lot of studies, uh, 2,100 um, hits in, um, in the database um, of papers, uh, when you filter out all the papers that did not meet criteria for some reason, um, and they weren't you know, robustly designed, um, uh, we basically had only six studies to, um, to use in our quantitative um, uh, assessment. Uh, so, or, sorry, our qualitative assessment. So, um, so what we show is that there's still a lot of research to be done. We have to keep pushing the envelope to get better studies on whether calprotectin does uh, correspond to uh, endoscopic healing. And I'll get to more of what I mean by that, but um, we found that if calprotectin um, uh, was elevated times two, uh, two uh, serial uh, testing, uh, you had up to a 83% chance of developing a disease flare uh, in the next two to three months. And if calprotectin was within range or normal in the target range uh, in the green um, uh, times two, there's a, a very good probability, up to 94% uh, probability that uh, you will continue, that the patient will continue to be in remission um, for the next two to three months. So we basically said in our discussion of this paper that uh, two consecutive um, elevated calprotectin values are highly associated with disease relapse, indicating that we need to think about optimizing IBD therapy plans uh, and that more prospective data are needed to assess whether fecal calprotectin monitoring really improves health outcomes. Um, and even as I was um, uh, preparing for this talk, there have been some really good papers coming into the into um, uh, PubMed uh, showing that uh, treating to target uh, using a using calprotectin um, is uh, potentially um, uh, effective in uh, improving health outcomes for patients. So. What is this mucosal healing? Why is it important? Why are we thinking that we need to get to the state of mucosal healing? Well, literature in the inflammatory bowel disease world shows that uh, when you achieve present-day complete healing um, deep into the mucosa, 
uh, deep remission, you are potentially able to um, bypass more aggressive future disease. So it's future modifying uh, the disease um, for the patient. Uh, and I see that in, in my practice as I am um, um, taking care of patients over years uh, of, uh, of their early, early childhood into young adulthood, that patients who go into this deep remission are more likely to stay in that deep remission uh, for a longer period of time, even if they get off of meds or change medications for some reason. And interestingly, uh, disease activity indices, such as um, Crohn's disease activity Inde index, uh, the CDAI, uh, and the um, ulcerative colitis index, these, are, uh, these were helpful, these are still helpful, but I think they are falling a bit more out of favor and perhaps uh, we, should th we should be thinking about uh, calprotectin as, a, uh, and as, an, uh, as an objective biomarker to calibrate our therapy plans. So I wish uh, we had a better way of monitoring disease. Um, um, we, I, I wish there was a pill cam that just, you know, takes biopsies and I don't have to put patients into uncomfortable anesthesia or or, or, you know, have the risk of perforation or uh, make them undergo a clean-out. Um, but really, this is the state of affair. We, uh, the picture of a colonoscope here uh, shows that we, we are still relying on the scope uh, to uh, monitor disease. And why is that important? Well, it's important, as, as I said before, uh, patients... Um, want a non-invasive approach to monitoring. So my third case is actually um, um, a boy who we'll call Cole, and he uh, came to me uh, from a rural area uh, just south of Oregon um, in north, northern California. Uh, he had very severe fistulizing and stricturing type of small bowel Crohn's disease, uh, he was eight when he was diagnosed. He had an auto perforation, meaning his bowel um, um, bowel uh, ruptured, and he had septic shock. He was very ill, and he had multiple abdominal surgeries and um, and small bowel resections. Um, and when you have a loss of bowel, you're not able to make as much calprotectin as um, as someone who might have longer length of bowel. So for him, calprotectin was never that high. It was not ever in the 500 and 1,000. It's always sort of in, you know, um, under 150. But 150 monitoring uh, for the majority of my patients would be would be fine. I would actually be okay with the 150. Um, but his calprotectin, if it's over 100, uh, it is worrisome. So this is where the personalization of that quantitative level, the value, can be important to individualize the care delivered for patients like Cole, who has uh, less bowel, for example. Um, and I think this is the structural framework that I want to showcase, introducing this idea of personalized health and monitoring uh, using calprotectin. If personalized treatment strategy is the goal, you have uh, at each of the three corners here um, a personalized way of uh, thinking about the economics of IBD, not doing too much and not doing too little, right? Um, uh, what tests are valuable? Um, we are uh, thinking about therapeutics. Uh, does this patient um, go on um, one biologic versus a small molecule? And then at the last corner is that, you know, is that um, entity that we're talking about in monitoring. How do we monitor non-invasively as much as possible uh, um, in a personalized way? Um, 
And uh, I don't think in the near future colonoscopy, endoscopy will go away because, as I said, we still need that histopathology. That histology is going to be the gold standard. Uh, but we do need to monitor more frequently uh, patients with the disease uh, without getting um, invasive. So patients are now, uh, some of my patients are now sort of uh, taking the liberty of um, sending me Excel spreadsheets of their calprotectin trends over time. <laughs> uh, this is a, a patient who loves to uh, work with Excel, and uh, he sent me his nice uh, uh, run chart, is what we call it, um, and you can see the green dots, how calprotectin was quite elevated when we were trying to get him into deep remission, and he uh, finally... Uh, started a treatment plan that worked for him, and he's in good remission, uh, as you can see in this run chart. Uh, clearly, his calprotectins have been uh, persistently under 100, which is great. Um, so uh, going back to that variability quote, and, um, and this is where in the beginning of the presentation I talked about how there are some pragmatic take-home tips on stool collection that I wanted to talk about. And I think um, it's important to kind of standardize the collection as much as possible. Uh, and we can discuss this in the Q&A because there's certainly a lot of ways to think about this and how do we educate patients on when is the best time to collect given people's busy schedules in the morning. But calprotectin in the morning is what I recommend getting that stool sample in the morning because there is up to a 26% um, sorry, a 23% uh, um, uh, variability um, depending on whether you get it in the morning or at night. So I always say standardize your calprotectin uh, sampling, uh, collect it in the morning, um, because we certainly want to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples. Uh, it would basically be the same analogy of, uh, of using different scales to weigh yourself when you know the scales haven't been calibrated. Um, so I think that's one potential um, education that we can improve upon um, uh, as clinicians. So I want to talk a little bit about three different things very quickly um, um, that I think really pertains to gastroenterologists and the practicing clinician. A cal number one, Calprotectin predicts endoscopic activity. So you can see that the Mayo score, which is the score that we use, the endoscopic scoring system, to say whether the patient has deep remission or not, um, you know, Mayo score less than or equal to one is uh, deep remission, um, and it predicts really well. Calprotectin predicted endoscopic uh, remission um, in over 90%, whether you're using the standard ELISA or whether you're using the point-of-care test, okay? Uh, second, uh, calprotectin predicts IBD relapse. So in this particular study, again, by Trimble, and Tribble, um, we're showing that, um, that the um, uh, predicted um, uh, 50, per, uh, 50 microgram per gram predicted relapse with 90% sensitivity and 83% specificity. Uh, and interestingly, this is the paper uh, in my mind that sort of raised the point that um, these biochemical uh, blood markers to monitor disease that we've been doing for, you know, years may not be as good as the calprotectin. So the ESR and the CRP did not significantly differ between relapse and non-relapse states, but calprotectin did. So number three, calprotectin predicts drug responsiveness. Um, and this is where um, when, I, when I start a patient on a very expensive um, therapy plan uh, like the biological agents, I will get repeated measurements of calprotectin uh, to see whether they will ultimately respond or not respond. So uh, calprotectin was able to predict uh, whether patients would be responding to um, infliximab, in this case, um, at, um, at week 10. Uh, 
So um, I'm going to now uh, close the talk and start wrapping this up uh, by talking about the future utility of calprotectin. Um, and this is where we need to do more research. What is the accuracy of calprotectin as a clinical endpoint for endoscopic and histologic activity according to different gastrointestinal tracts? So as you recall, um, uh, my, some of my patients had small bowel disease only. They, their colon was not affected. So in patients who only have regional disease, their calprotectin should be different, their cutoff should be different than patients who have their entire colon affected, right? Um, the second question, what is the correlation of calprotectin monitoring with disease activity indices, CRP, and patient reported outcomes? So essentially, we've been doing the same thing for years, monitoring their CRP, monitoring their uh, uh, their disease activity indices, but really, um, have we done an, a, a true confirmatory test that uh, showcases that calprotectin may may not may be the only thing you need? Uh, why are we doing some of these other blood monitoring tests? Um, and uh, can we use the calprotectin to fine tune and adjust and personalize? therapy plans uh, before um, the check engine light comes on, before the overt, sim uh, before the overt symptoms. Um, and, um, and then third question, what is the comparative effectiveness of calprotectin uh, compared to other biomarkers that we know exist? Um, because we certainly want to not, uh, um, uh, we certainly don't want to settle on a biomarker that is perhaps uh, not as good as other biomarkers or a collection of biomarkers that we have yet to discover. Um, and I want to showcase here um, just some critical knowledge gap and research priority that I think um, uh, um, should be noted. Um, and this research, um, uh, this international consensus of experts uh, called the STRIDE Initiative, concluded that um, there is a major knowledge gap for fecal biomarkers uh, serving as endpoints of mucosal level inflammation uh, despite ongoing clinical use. We can be using this test um, for um, many years to come, uh, but we still haven't settled uh, the question of whether or not this can be used as a, as a true endpoint. Um, and I think uh, here prospective studies are needed to better uh, understand uh, this question. And interestingly, a joint consensus statement by uh, folks from the FDA and the European Medicines Agency, Health Canada, and um, Pharmaceuticals and um, Medical Device Agency of Japan uh, concluded that accelerating the evidence to use non-invasive biomarkers as reliable surrogate endpoints is a top research priority in uh, children affected with inflammatory bowel disease because we certainly cannot be uh, undergoing general anesthesia and having uh, our, our kids affected by this disease uh, undergo repeated measurements uh, with um, colonoscopy. So I think um, the last slide here is just, again, the, the uh, strength of evidence pyramid showcases that we certainly can uh, rely on the surveys and the case control studies and the co even the cohort studies, but we really need the randomized control trials and the systematic reviews. Remember, our systematic review only had six studies that met uh, um, criteria uh, um, for inclusion. So um, more research needs to be done, um, uh, and um, uh, I think the future of calprotectin testing it, 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 um, uh, has value um, as long as we understand that there are knowledge gaps that we're still needing to uh, answer. So with that, I'm out of time, um, and I'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you so much for your time.
Thank you, Dr. Park, for your informative presentation. It is now time for our live Q&A portion of our webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just type them into the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. If we are unable to get to your questions, Dr. Park will answer them via email following the presentation. So let's get started. Our first question is, You mentioned more studies needed for mucosal healing indication, but what's your experience been? Well, I just want to reiterate the fact that um, mucosal healing uh, has been uh, going back and forth for years now. And uh, the definition of mucosal healing, uh, at least for now among clinicians, uh, seem to be uh, endoscopic or histologic evidence of uh, no inflammation. Um, and my experience has been obviously um, tempered by the fact that I do less invasive colonoscopies than, say, uh, our adult counterparts who do a lot more uh, endoscopic um, evaluations because they don't have to put their patients under general anesthesia. But I think the consensus overall is that that is the optimal endpoint uh, of choice. We are all among the IBD specialists um, aiming for that, uh, that gold standard of endoscopic and hopefully histologic um, absence of inflammation. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, um, clearly heard. We are aiming for endoscopic healing and histologic healing, uh, but it is difficult to get, as I mentioned. Our next question is, my providers see the value of calprotectin, but I'm hearing complaints on reimbursement. Are you seeing the same issue? Uh, absolutely. So I would say that uh, there is, again, variability between um, uh, uh, different geographical areas uh, where uh, payers may be um, different uh, in terms of uh, whether their bylaws and their clinical guidance of what can be reimbursed uh, um, uh, as they're going, as they're being updated. So the payers uh, recognize that calprotectin is being used, but they're often uh, seeing just the diagnostic one-time uh, screening calprotectin test as something that is more evidence-based than the monitoring of uh, patients with repeated calprotectin measures. Now, um, as we showed through our systematic review, there are plenty of uh, papers coming through the pipeline, but the uh, robustness or the strength of evidence for monitoring will need to be um, uh, prioritized. So one of the major um, uh, work between the AGA and the ACG and the North American Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, particularly um, um, in our society, the Pediatric Gastroenterology Society, we have uh, resources for our members, uh, the clinician members, uh, letters and templates where we can uh, go to the appeals process and uh, showcase uh, the emerging evidence and the value of uh, getting the calprotectin covered for the monitoring piece. So yes, there is variability. Yes, I'm still seeing um, calprotectin denied, but it is getting better every year as the evidence gets better. Our next question is, from your experience, what is the sensitivity of the fecal calprotectin test for proximal disease? 
That is a great question. Um, I think when the uh, when the question uh, is that what the question is asking is I think what is the uh, uh, sensitivity of upper tract GI disease, uh, meaning Crohn's disease limited to the small intestine. I think that's what the question is asking. And I would say that um, it is uh, unknown at this time, as uh, my first patient in this case presentation, uh, I called her Stacy. Um, she had upper tract Crohn's disease. She did not have iliocolonic or colonic Crohn's, where you would expect more of the quantitative rise in the calprotectin. But if you notice that her calprotectin was still a little bit elevated beyond what I was comfortable with. So essentially, if you have visible lesions in the upper intestinal tract, um, in the duodenum, jejunum, um, you're likely going to have calprotectin levels greater than 50 microgram per gram. And that should be your check engine light to evaluate further for a real conclusive diagnosis um, if you're doing the calprotectin as a screening or, or continue to uh, recognize that there may be ongoing um, uh, visible lesions and a non-mucosal healed state if you're using calprotectin as a monitoring uh, test um, after the diagnosis. So what is the sensitivity uh, for upper tract Crohn's disease? Um, I would say it depends on the cutoff. And if the cutoff is for monitoring is 50, I would say it's still uh, very good, uh, possibly into the uh, um, 90%. But again, uh, as I said, this is uh, needing uh, further validation with uh, longitudinal studies in uh, that particular subgroup of patients, as I mentioned in the presentation. Can our food habits cause any IBD? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Not a problem. Can our food habits cause any IBD? Right. Uh, the food habit causing IBD is is arguably a Nobel Prize winning question. <laughs> um, so I, I could literally spend hours on this discussion. Um, the foods we eat uh, alter and change our gut microbiota uh, with each and every meal. Um, the viruses that we're exposed to, the fungus, the uh, microbial ecology that, uh, that, that um, is perpetually around us um, will affect moment by moment uh, the ecology of the living microbiota uh, within our GI tract. Uh, and we're outnumbered by our gut bacteria uh, 10 to 1 um, um, for human cells. So clearly, uh, our, the foods we eat will feed our bacteria and will be the fodder, uh, for lack of a better term, for uh, this incredible uh, um, jungle of, of, of gut bacteria. Some gut bacteria are pro-inflammatory, some are anti-inflammatory and protective of inflammation. But the gut bacteria uh, serve as uh, a protective layer uh, based on the, the secretions that they make, such as mucus, such as uh, such as uh, short-chain fatty acids, and when you have a very westernized diet, meaning low plant fibers, yes, you are more prone for 
the literature suggests that we are more prone for uh, uh, for increasing interaction between the environment and our uh, and our the immunology that goes on in our blood. And when that occurs, that vulnerable state called dysbiosis, where our gut microbiota uh, are uh, not diverse and 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 not abundant, our immunity, our immune system may start to sample our um, GI tract and somehow get confused that it's actually something to uh, seek and destroy uh, or target at least and cause um, a, an immune response. And that's really what um, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis is. It's, it's the self recognizing the epithelial tract of your, uh, of your GI tract as something to uh, begin to attack. Um, the classic autoimmune story. Uh, so um, while the uh, foods we eat can alter the bacteria, we certainly require uh, more research in the etiological causes because uh, diet is just one factor, um, and we haven't uh, uh, and we need to consider that our um, uh, that our environment is changing. Everything around us is continuing to evolve. Um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but I do know that among my patients who have the diagnosis of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, when their diet uh, uh, consists of more plant-based foods and they start to think about their micro taking care of their microbiota, they tend to have less inflammation overall. All right, so our next question is, what specifically do you do to handle denials for reimbursement? Absolutely. So, um, number one, when I get a denial, um, I, try to, uh, I try to send the template letter that I have uh, whether the denial, I, I rarely get denials for screen as a screening test. Uh, I I am still getting a few denials for monitoring uh, IBD uh, using calprotectin. So number one, I have a um, a ready to go letter with my top five to seven. Um, literature um, papers showcasing the clinical utility of calprotectin monitoring. Um, and I send that off to the payer, and I am uh, following up uh, with my office administrative uh, team to make sure that the payer received that letter and it gets into the right hands. Uh, so I think that's an I, I think that's a very important follow through. When you get that denial, you don't just send off a letter. You have to follow. Have, somebody has to follow through and make sure that it was received and that it's being reviewed. Um, at the second tier, uh, when I send off the calprotectin um, as a monitoring, I make sure that the diagnosis is correct. Um, it is Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, but why am I sending off a calprotectin? I'm sending it off because my patients are having symptoms. So I, uh, I, I click that they're having uh, diarrhea, bloody stools, or abdominal pain, etc. And I think that's the granularity that the payers are familiar with, not, oh, they have Crohn's. They're sending off calprotectin. I think it's got to be symptom-based indication. So, uh, so I make sure that that's really indicated in my note and in the um, uh, in the um, uh, clinic diagnosis um, codes. Um, and I think thirdly, um, 
if that doesn't work, uh, we have to do a peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, and that's where physicians have variability in how aggressively we go to battle. Um, and I, I, I'm in the camp that uh, Calprotectin uh, uh, monitoring improves the value of care. So uh, that's my um, paradigm and the worldview that I come, that I am uh, using Calprotectin. So I will go as far as I need to go uh, and call up the medical director <laughs> at the payer uh, to talk to them about the utility and ask even to let me see your guidance on Calprotectin coverage. And when that is uh, reviewed, I often note that their last literature ref uh, uh, refresh was from 2014. Uh, so I kindly uh, have a bi-directional dialogue that um, you may want to consider updating your, uh, your uh, guidance um, internal guidance on what is what should be covered. Uh, sometimes they just need to uh, be reminded of the updated literature. Uh, and then I think lastly, we are all working at the national level. Societies are um, providing resources, and I know from uh, uh, from my involvement and work with the uh, with NASPGAN, the North American Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology. Uh, hepatology and nutrition that we have uh, readily available resources uh, uh, and template letters, et cetera, for our uh, uh, clinician members. So lengthy, uh, lengthy uh, monologue there about how to uh, try to get it covered. So it looks like we have time for one more question, and just a reminder, if we didn't have time to get to your question, they will be answered via email following the presentation. Would you clarify how often do you request calprotectin in a recently diagnosed patient before remission or after remission? Uh, that's a tough question, only because every patient is different. Uh, the, vari the law of variability, uh, but um, what, let's just assume that the patient is uh, starting uh, anti-TNF therapy, um, you know, one of the two uh, primary biologics that, um, uh, there are several anti-TNF uh, therapies, but uh, we usually go to two, uh, we have two op primary options. Uh, so. In those situations, I try to uh, get a calprotectin at baseline, uh, obviously, uh, before therapy. And then uh, usually I try to get one uh, towards the end of induction, which is around one month to six weeks. And then I, uh, depending on how that patient is doing, I follow uh, my... Uh, systematic review uh, findings. Um, after I understand the treatment response at the induction phase of anti-TNF therapy, I then monitor every one to three months. Um, and I would say that if you go past the third month um, uh, and they're a new diagnosis of um, of inflammatory bowel disease, you may be missing the opportunity to calibrate your therapy and, and possibly optimize treatment strategies to get them, uh, get your patient to earlier deep remission um, uh, since, um, since clinical remission doesn't always indicate mucosal healing or deep remission as we discussed. So uh, to summarize, a calprotectin at diagnosis, right, or, and then a repeat calprotectin towards the uh, end of induction, sometime, sometime between four to six week mark, and then depending on the patient uh, and how they're responding, uh, it's every one to three months thereafter. Thank you again, Dr. Park. Do you have any final comments for our audience? 
I think the final take-home point is that we need to continue to push the literature. We have to continue to uh, think outside the box on non-invasive biomarkers, continue to think outside of just calprotectin. We have to uh, accelerate the science um, uh, of non-invasive biomarker monitoring of disease. Um, and then we have to um, use that literature to serve our patients um, who would benefit from, uh, from such a non-invasive, more convenient way of monitoring their disease. I would like to once again thank Dr. KT Park for his presentation. I'd also like to thank Labyrinth and Innova Diagnostics for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through July of 2018. You will receive an email from Labyrinth letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.